I usually don't mention uh, my upcoming absences, uh, but um, I, I've been asked to uh, help at Overland Park while their pastor's on sabbatical the first two Sundays and the last two Sundays of his sabbatical. And so the first two are the next two. Uh, the last two are sometime in October. <coughs> uh, so I will be uh, in town but not here the uh, next two Sundays. Uh, pardon? Uh, I would need to leave at about 10 after, I think, to get there. <laughs> and so uh, Gigi has made arrangements with folks graciously uh, helping to, to volunteer. Um, I, I've, um, I've preached in lots of churches. Uh, it, it's fairly rare that I am assigned a text I'm supposed to preach on. <laughs> and asked for a title like uh, two weeks before this, the sermons <laughs> and so so I'm looking forward to that time I actually spent uh, quite a few weeks as an interim supply there um, back in the 96 year uh, before being invited to teach in this class and so that was kind of my last gig before I started working uh, here at First Church. You know, Roger, it's very easy for us to say they can't take our man away. But I do recall uh, when we had a very popular uh, music director. And the bottom line is we are very thrilled to be able to share music with other people who get to have your ministry. And uh, I think that's I have felt comfortable feeling that. I hope we all do. Thank you. Um, but there's a certain resistance in me to, to thinking I am owned by you. No, that's not wrong. That's good. Oh, we recognize your independence. No, he's ours. I'm also thankful for. Uh, several things. Um, part of our coming back a little bit early for vacation, I was asked by, uh, I'm not sure who, the district superintendent as well as the new Spanish coordinator on our district to, uh, to speak yesterday. And I think it's a new event that the Spanish churches are doing the Saturday before the district assembly and all those things happened that week uh, of a big Spanish fest. They had over 300 folks at College Church yesterday. Um, and uh, I managed to be on my feet uh, quite a few hours, partly for the music, <laughs> and for the, uh, uh, it was close to an hour that I spoke uh, on holiness that they asked me to. And uh, so I'm grateful for Google Translate, which uh, I worked on all through the night of uh, Friday night. <laughs> and uh, Google Translate is not infallible or inerrant, and so I had to uh, redo some things, but it was a nice start and helped to get some things going. And uh, as always the case when I'm with Spanish-speaking folks, I'm inspired by their um, passion and their energy and their commitment. Uh, and um, <clears throat> their responsiveness uh, to the Word of God. Um, I realized at the end I'd gone over my time a little bit and uh, they were applauding and I wasn't quite sure what you do with uh, applause at the end of what's uh, a, a, a lecture or a sermon or whatever it was. So I just sat down. <laughs> and the coordinator got up and gave an altar call for about 20 minutes, and <laughs> which wasn't as long as the call for the offering, which happened after that. Uh, fortunately, I got to sit through the call for the offering. So thankful for God's help in all of that. But I want to keep moving along on uh, Genesis because with uh, some of these interruptions, the end of Genesis will be delayed for us a, a little bit. Um, we're nearing the end of Jacob's life. Um, we'll finish that, not, not the whole of the narrative, we'll, we'll get into the beginning of the end of his uh, life uh, in today's lesson. Um, and in a certain sense, as I thought about that yesterday, it's like uh, there were these multiple years of separation that Jacob, as far as he knew, Joseph was dead. 
And uh, Joseph had no idea if his father was still alive. And so there's this, uh, for the first time in the uh, sort of, well, not quite true, I guess. Jacob and Isaac had some problems, too, of separation for a number of years. Uh, But you have this kind of, uh, will they be reunited? What will happen? Uh, When will they find out? And and, uh, it's sort of in the background of possibility uh, until the famine comes and the brothers come down to receive food and Joseph recognizes them. And all of a sudden, the possibility, will father and son be reunited? This is favorite son, remember. Uh, What what lies ahead at this point? And uh, um, as you remember, the the narrator kind of slowed things down with Joseph and his brothers, sort of Joseph testing them to see what was... Uh, progressing in their own lives and their own kind of integrity and commitments and uh, finally reveals himself and and one of his first questions is my father still alive and and there's excitement over this discovery of uh, Joseph once again and even Pharaoh gets in on the business and orders wagons to be provided to move him down there and they come and uh, a couple weeks ago we uh, uh, we dealt with the text that um, the beginning part of chapter 47. Uh, they've arrived. They're settled in the land of Goshen, the finest land. Uh, by the by, it's occasionally called uh, Ramses instead of Goshen, which is uh, some later writers' sort of editorial comments of the new name. Uh, Ramses, as many of you now know from uh, movies, uh, became... Uh, uh, came to the throne really in the um, let's see uh, late 14th the uh, 13th century mostly and then into the 12th century uh, well 13th century into 12th century and in the, in the 11th uh, so that uh, by some accounts anyway of the date of the Exodus he would be the Pharaoh in the time of Moses and the Exodus um, so so that's a later time that he that that name becomes prominent but it, it's a way of recognizing, hey, if Ramses takes over Goshen and makes it his territory, what kind of territory is it? The pretty good Paris. stuff. Yeah, it's pretty fine material. Uh, and uh, pr- probably the fact that that hadn't happened earlier is uh, the whole long history of Egypt, upper and lower Egypt uh, being built around the Nile and uh, farther south being uh, more prominent in the earlier history of, of the nation of Egypt. Uh, but th- the last text that we read uh, two weeks ago, Jacob is brought actually and introduced to Pharaoh. And you remember what he does? He blesses Pharaoh. Uh, twice it describes him blessing Pharaoh, uh, w- which is a sort of a fascinating kind of thing. <clears throat> we haven't maybe ref- we reflected a little bit on the fact that that assumes <coughs> a kind of if you want to call it superiority. Uh, Inferiors don't bless, uh, in, give blessings to. Uh, it, it's an honor, shame kind of piece. It's the transference of honor. Uh, so, so there's a lot of interesting things there to it. Uh, and, and I just want it to be back in our mind as we start into now a uh, paragraph that uh, I suppose because I'm getting old and dull, I, I can't think of anything to call it except sort of odd. Uh, it... it Oh, not. Somebody read 47, 13 to 26 for us, if you would. Now there was no food in all the land, for the famine was very severe. The land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money to be found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan in exchange for the grain that they bought. And Joseph brought the money into Pharaoh's house. When the money from the land of Egypt and from the land of Canaan was spent... All the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? For our money is gone. And Joseph answered, Give me your livestock, and I will give you food in exchange for your livestock if your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph. And Joseph gave them food in exchange for the horses, the flocks, the herds, and the donkeys. That year he supplied them with food in exchange for all their livestock. When that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We cannot hide from my Lord that our money is all spent, and the herds of cattle are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Shall we die before your eyes, both we and our land? 
buy us and our land in exchange for food. We, with our land, will become slaves to Pharaoh. Just give us seed, so that we may live and not die, and that the land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. All the Egyptians sold their fields, because the famine was severe, severe upon them, and the land became Pharaoh's. As for the people, he made slaves of them from one end of Egypt to the other. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had a fixed allowance from Pharaoh and lived on the allowance that Pharaoh gave them. Therefore, they did not sell their land. Then Joseph said to the people, Now that I have this day bought you and your land for Pharaoh, here is seed for you, sow the land. And at the harvest you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh, and four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field, and as food for yourselves and your households, and as food for your little ones. They said, You have saved our lives. May it please my Lord. We will be slaves to Pharaoh. So Joseph made it a, a statute concerning the land of Egypt, and it stands to this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth. The land of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh's. Seems hard, huh? Hard. Well, let me ask a very rude question. <clears throat> What's this passage doing in the text here? Why is it here? I don't Renee? I think this represents an example of our surrender to our God. And as we, nothing is really ours, and our sustenance comes from him, not from what we possess or hold on to. And we can equate or make it sustainable as well as he can. And so as Joseph has done that surrender himself, because he forsaken, he was in prison, he had nothing, no family, nothing. But he constantly leaned on the Lord and, and, and trusted and believed. And as the people did so, their lives were saved, their families were saved, and they could sustain them through the four fifths. And that's our tie to the Lord. But the fifth actually is really 20% rather than 10%. And so um, it's an example to me of that reciprocation from the Lord. Okay. Uh, maybe to go along with that, uh, the understanding in Egypt, Egyptian uh, society uh, that Pharaoh was a deity. Yeah. Okay, I, I thought I heard someone in here starting. Uh, yeah, I think she's being much more generous than I'd be. <laughs> okay. I think, well, That's I think the I'm downside sure. of letting Renee talk first. Yeah. She always has um, a spiritual turnout on it. <laughs> the only thing I can see in this is that it shows Joseph's administrational skills. Okay. He is, he's working for his boss. Okay. And that's the only reason. And it also shows his honesty in bringing in the money to Pharaoh's house. Where you, I was thinking as they were reading about that, I thought, you know, he could have kept part of that. But hopefully, it, wait, it looks like he turned it all over to Pharaoh. Okay. I, I don't know these comments are mutually exclusive or contradictory. But yeah, uh, lots of commentaries talk about this as example of him being uh, the great administrator. And uh, yeah, uh, you, you don't have to have been where you guys have lived to know uh, corruption at various levels of government is always a uh, concern and a problem. Yeah. Uh, Carol and then Doug. It strikes me it could be there to explain how the people got to be in the state that they did, the history, you know, how they got to be enslaved. And also, I see it as an example today about better government uh, than just giving people, you know, giving, giving, because this isn't a Christian approach, per se. You know, Christians would just hand out all this food and then they'd end up with nothing. You know, it was well managed. Okay. And the people had to pay something for work, you know, for something. So. Okay. Um, yeah. Doug? Thinking of the principle of you reap what you sow, and knowing that the Hebrews will in 
themselves end up being slaves, <coughs> here is a Hebrew making slaves. So is this somehow a, a little bit of a seed planted for what we'll see down the road uh, in slavery of the people of Israel? That is a comment made by um, James McCowan, I think is his name in the uh, Two Horizons Theological Commentary. He says, he, he does it kind of ironically. They're going to be slaves, and whoa, the whole idea apparently is started by a Hebrew. Uh, what comes around happened, goes around. It does feel a little odd reading this. Yeah, yeah. It's like he should know better. Of course, yeah. that's anachronistic. Yeah. Uh, and, and the uh, suggestion that Carol made, this is a way of explaining how things came to be this way in Egypt, is a common uh, comment in commentaries. In fact, uh, uh, it, it, there's, a, there's a word that describes stories that do that, it's called etiological, that describes the origin of certain customs or features, practices, what, whatever. Uh, part of the debate that happens is whether uh, Joseph, in fact, is the first to sort of institute this relationship of Pharaoh owning everything, or if it uh, predates him and he's given credit for it or what. And the, uh, certainly in later Egyptian history, the Pharaoh was, had this kind of ownership and control over all the land. The question of whether it predates, uh, it, it appears that uh, later history says it's been this way forever in Egypt, but there isn't anything in the older than Joseph kind of records that says it was that way, so we, we don't really know. Uh, but it, it does give kind of an explanation of the way things uh, either always were or came to be of um, Pharaoh being perceived, well, Pharaoh owning everything and all belonging to him and everybody being almost a tenant farmer or a tenant of, uh, of the Pharaoh. So, uh, let me come, Nancy, and then we'll come back to you, Marcia, since you already. Uh, I'm just wondering things probably nobody else thinks about, but do you suppose the people knew of Pharaoh's dreams? So they knew what they were headed for? I don't know. Because if they did, that might make this go down a little easier. Might. They realized yeah. it was a kind of a... Uh, I think, I think, if, uh, to, to try to put myself in Pharaoh's boots, given what I think I know about Pharaoh, I, I think I probably wouldn't have told him, uh, because I'd like to keep, knowledge is power. Right, exactly. And to, to keep that for oneself is, is the advantage. Uh, on the other hand, um, explaining it would have given reason for why you collected so much of the surplus in the years of plenty. Well, they didn't seem to fight it. I mean, we don't have any information that they fought it. Yeah, it seemed like a peaceful word. To yeah. Do well. I wonder if he is easy to make things peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that common people can rise up and uh, fight against their rulers is a relatively modern idea. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, There's Martha. two things. One is the, the food came from the people in the first place, the Egyptians. Not, I mean, I, I understand making borders pay, but I didn't understand making the old people that had raised the food to pay. That, that bothered me. But the other thing that bothered me is if, if it's, I don't know how long they were slaves, but if they were slaves, why do they need to make the Hebrew slaves? I didn't get that part. Either. Yeah, there's a, actually a change of dynasty of political rulers. Uh, one family is deposed. Actually, <clears throat> between this time and when the when the Hebrews become enslaved, there's a period in which Semitic people themselves become the rulers of Egypt. Now, whether they are related directly to uh, Jacob Joseph family or not is never. I mean, we have no way of connecting that in Scripture. But uh, th that does happen in the between times. So that, it, it's easy for us to say Egypt. Uh, and we're sort of uh, swinging over almost 2,000 years of history in our conversation, even more than 2,000 years of history in our conversation here, which means there's, there's a variety of things that are happening in the Egyptian political scene. Carol? I'd like to address this issue of slavery, not from a from a positive viewpoint, just because it's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, my whole life, I have shouted against the concept of ownership. Whether it be 
slaves or whether it be children or wives or anything else is chattel. And I have never understood and I don't accept just because slavery is mentioned in the Bible that that makes it okay. And I'm a great fan, as anybody knows me, of Joseph. I don't have any admiration for him in this case where he ended up making people slaves. Because I think we need to stand up, and I don't care if it's in the scripture and our heritage as Judeo-Christians or not, I think we need to speak out against ever slavery ever having occurred. And I, spend, I plan to spend every opportunity I get to speak to this for the rest of my life. And uh, so uh, I take issue with Joseph in this situation. Okay. And I think that reflects, if I can put it this way, um, the enlightened development of the people of God across time since Joseph's time. That God has come to help lots of folks understand this in ways that he obviously didn't. Yeah, yeah, Jacob. I'm getting kind of away from the context a little bit, but when I'm reading this, I'm getting a whole bunch of questions. Um, like, obviously, the Pharaoh has all this food that he's giving everybody. Where did that food come from? If the entire land's in famine. Um, additionally they're giving the pharaoh all this stuff that basically they use to make the food. Mm -hmm. Why can't they just use that? Or like they talk about having seed, or all they need is seed from the pharaoh. Why can't they trade their livestock for seed and then feed themselves for the next year? Because apparently like they can use seed to make their stuff, so make their food, so apparently yeah. there's some kind of rain going on. Their full logic doesn't make any sense to me. There are some leaps of logic in this text. <laughs> Uh, presumably, the um, presumably the, the grain comes from the surplus that was gathered in the seven years of plenty. Uh, <clears throat> but the question is, uh, and it's related maybe to Nancy's question: did, did they know about seven years of famine that were prophesied in the dream or not? Uh, uh, they keep planting, as the giving of the seed tells. Uh, the seven years of famine suggest that the crops don't turn out as well, and so you don't get a, a you don't get the profit margin to survive, and so they're reduced to uh, borrowing, uh, and, and so they sell their livestock one year, uh, uh, they sell themselves, they sell their land successively to to, to try to survive. Uh, I was going to resist this for a while, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, all the old farm people ought to be feeling, yeah, this is the way it goes. <laughs> uh, that uh, uh, the farm economy is so dependent upon weather-related kinds of issues. And uh, uh, when uh, the majority of your income, uh, your livelihood, is staked on one crop, uh, when it fails, uh, your, the, the economic impact is uh, <laughs> devastating in ways that those of us who now have nine to five jobs and get a paycheck every week, two weeks, or month, whatever it is, uh, have, have a hard time imagining. A and so, uh, but what do you do when that happens to you? Uh, well, n nowadays, well, move to town and get a job. Couldn't do that in that world. Uh, jobs were locked already into positions and status and things like that. So you got you got to do another crop. Uh, uh, we've well, had lots of rain. And, and pardon? Well, the federal government comes in. And helps. Yeah. Uh, well, that's what the federal government was doing in this text. <laughs> uh, I was remembering uh, partly from things we saw driving to Colorado and back and all the rain that we've had. Uh, there was a year for my folks left Nebraska that <clears throat> rain kind of like we've had around here kept happening and uh, washing out and destroying uh, three crops of corn my dad planted. So he planted a fourth one. And it's into June by the time that happens, which means it isn't going to be a decent crop at all when it turns out at the end. But what are you going to do? Uh, and, and so I think there's a little bit of that in these people. <coughs> Uh, if they'd known famine was coming, they should have said, we're just going to hunker down here, start stealing grain or something, and try to survive. But 
you got to keep hoping for the next year. That's what agricultural people do. What? Uh, how did they come about owning the land to begin with? Well, that's an interesting question. I'm guessing it's we would call it um, squatters rights, mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of thing. I would have thought Pharaoh owned it all. Anyway. Well, that's part of the question of when does that become established policy? And this is a way that names it. Uh, Renee? In, in uh, contemplating about the, the slavery and uh, being uh, a slave, uh, it's, it's in the Bible that um, being a, a slave is like being captive to, or uh, which means that you can be a captive to sin, or you can be a captive to righteousness. And what it means is you're compelled to live in a manner that abides by the dictates of what that means. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are unworthy or less or uh, encumbered or handicapped. It means that you are captivated to either sin or righteousness. So slavery is not necessarily a, a, he even says a slave is free if he is with the Lord Jesus. Part of what's at work there, I think, is slavery was such a pervasive reality that it became a metaphor by which they explained all kinds of relationships. Uh, John, and then we got to move on to a couple other questions in this text. <laughs> I, I'm captivated, captivated by the fact that you have Egypt and Canaan in the same sentence. Uh -huh. That there's an acknowledgement that there's a famine in the, the superpower of the day, and there's also a famine in the world of the nomads. And the, for whatever reason, you put these two peoples together. Obviously, it's because of Joseph's, Joseph's in Egypt. But if you look down the passage, there's not much of a reference to Canaan. The, the, the rest of the story seems to be on Egypt's response to Joseph and the, the, the trading and the selling of goods for mm -hmm. survival. And if this is in a Hebrew Bible, I think I'm challenged to look at it from my Hebrew pers perspective. There's something in there that I'm supposed to be catching. Okay. Uh, if I don't forget, I'll try to pick that up here momentarily. But to note your, your uh, Egypt and Canaan reference, that happens early on, <clears throat> and it stops in verse 15. Uh, it, it, it looks like this process is a means by which Joseph not only takes all the money from the Egyptians, he takes all the money from the Canaanites, <clears throat> from people from Canaan. Uh, but when it comes to the livestock, well, all of a sudden Canaan disappears. When it comes to selling of themselves into slavery, Canaan isn't there. When it comes to the, the land being Pharaoh's, Canaan isn't there. A and so I I'm not sure. Uh, commentaries start down this path and then they just sort of fly off in different directions and, and don't ever finish the, the train of thought. Uh, so I'll do the same. Uh, it, it seems to me that a part of this is to say, yeah, when it was just money, Canaan and Egypt were, were at the same level. But when it came to slavery and favor owning the land, that's going to be the, if you want to call it, the future of Egypt. It is not the future of Canaan. And, and I think uh, a, a part of what... Um, Well, uh, part of what lies related to, to Carol's concern, um, slavery keeps being intertwined in Israelite history, but, but there is a strong sense of the Israelite people are to be free people because they're God's people, and, and a sense that that is the standard that God holds. Uh, and eventually it needs to be extended out to all people. But a part of what I think makes this text seem odd to us, well, there's two reasons. We're all modern folks. And so this seems like, oh, this is so ancient and slavery, that's so terrible. But we're also the heirs of the Judeo-Christian tradition that finally got to the conclusion to say, you know, uh, what God designed for his people belongs to all people, actually. And so this whole slavery thing is not a good thing. Uh, and so I think a part of the purpose of this text is to show, oh, things are worse with that regard in Egypt. 
than they are with God's people because God has another plan, another strategy for them. One other thing that we didn't get covered in all this meandering conversation of a possibility this text is here. Uh, one way you could take this, the last part of the preceding, uh, verse 12, well, the preceding paragraph, Jacob blessed Pharaoh. This is the blessings of Pharaoh really being blessed, is uh, the comment of some commentaries. Uh, uh, if you like being blessed uh, on the backs of other people, uh, that makes sense. Uh, maybe uh, the author of Genesis would have thought that way. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just a couple of things. Uh, the old farm boy again. Verse, uh, still verse 13. The land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished. Um, verse 19. Shall we die before your eyes, both we and our land? How is the land being conceptualized here? As a living thing. Yeah, it's, it's personified in a certain way. Uh, do you remember any place else in Genesis where that something like that seems to happen? Did the land cry out when it had a, it lost blood? Yeah, it's actually the blood cries out from the land, but it's a similar kind of concept in, in this is Genesis 4, that, that the land bears witness to uh, the murder of Abel, a, and that the land rises up in testimony against uh, so it, it's fascinating, just sort of the reflection here again of uh, land has uh, almost a mythic personal kind of character uh, in Scripture, which in part is, I think, related to the fact, w what's the big promise that's being made to this family that's, whose storyline we're tracing? They'll be given the land of Canaan, which is quite interesting uh, uh, apparently there weren't deeds and surveys and titles and things like that. Uh, title companies were not on, on track, I guess, in those days. And, uh, incidentally, a part of what go, goes on in the Middle East today uh, in Israel, uh, for years land was just owned by whoever lived there. And when modern Israel took over with a Western mindset, they said, you don't have, you don't have title. So that's how Israelis have justified moving into West Bank and displacing folks. A and it's a change of legal systems uh, of how land ownership is even established. So in, in this era, land is just a possession not by a title on file in some office. It's a gift that God gives because you live there. A and it then, what does the land give back to you? Life. Life. Uh, which is why the land protests the death of Abel a and it's also I think why um, uh, land has such an important role in, in all of this uh, section okay uh, well um, we've meandered over most of that let's try the next paragraph I'll regret this uh, somebody read 27 to 31 of chapter 47 Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the region of Goshen, and they gained possession of it, and were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt seventeen years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were one hundred forty-seven years. When the time of Israel's death drew near, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favor with you, put your hand under my thigh, and promise to deal loyally and truly with me. Do not bury me, bury me in Egypt. When I lie down with my ancestors, carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself on the head of his bed. I'll start in verse 27. What are the key words there? They gained possession of it and were fruitful in multiplying. Okay. Uh, actually, gained possessions uh, in it, not possession of oh, it. I uh, but I think that's a key expression. To gain possessions in it means what? <coughs> gain 
They prospered. Uh, they succeeded. Uh, <laughs> they didn't starve to death. Uh, they apparently, well, so how would you compare that situation with the paragraph we've just worked on? They were cared for by the Pharaoh Joseph. Yeah. They didn't have to sell. Kind of fascinating. Both before last paragraph in the stuff we've dealt with in preceding weeks, and now in this paragraph, <clears throat> the land of Goshen comes off pretty well. Pharaoh takes care of uh, Joseph's uh, family, and the Egyptians are the ones who suffer. All except, and we didn't even talk about that, the priests who are exempt from all this stuff in the Egyptian uh, were political they, system. I the would have been, among other, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so in that sense, there's a, if you want to call it, hand-in-glove relationship between them and Pharaoh. Uh, although, which is chicken, which is egg, is hard to say. Uh, fruitful and multiplied. Are those uh, strange new words for us? No, that's part of the promise, too. How, how far back does that take us? Before Abraham. Yeah, th th this is... Well, I don't know if it succeeded, but what's the first command given to a human being? Be fruitful and multiply, uh, which is why uh, uh, Jewish folks celebrate weddings. Uh, it, it's another uh, unit going to work on the first commandment of Scripture. Uh, yeah. um, so to say they were fruitful and multiplied there, that particular choice of words is saying they became thoroughly human and the provision that God had promised and commanded for humanity from the very beginning was taking place for them. It means the promises made to Abraham and the commands given to Abraham uh, are, are happening for them. Uh, and uh, probably that one is in, in some sense uh, for the book of Genesis more important, uh, although uh, when some of you are not old enough to remember when we were in Genesis 12, 13, 14. Uh, but when we were there, part of what we talked about is the repetition of those words uh, was a linkage back to Genesis chapter 1. And it was a way of saying God was beginning a new creation in the work of, uh, in the life of Abraham. And, and so in a sense, this is new creation sorts of language. But how is it different from the Abraham promise of being fruitful and multiplying or command to be fruitful and multiply? Where was Abraham to be fruitful and to multiply? In Canaan. In Canaan. Where are they now? What does that tell us? It makes you wonder if they strayed from God. Okay, that's a possibility. Okay. Uh, maybe the promises of God are not limited to a place. Maybe the blessings and grace of God will follow them wherever they go. Uh, yeah, it, 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 Dorothy? Well, I'm struck by it. It says, thus Israel settled okay. in the land. And if they've settled, then they quit looking back, or at least being prepared to go instantly back. go back mm -hmm. to, or right away, or next week or something, go back to um, land in Cana. And yet, they gained possession and were fruitful enough by not forgotten the connection. Well, the fact that I've got experience you wonder, every day. wonder if they strayed from the promise because they got settled in Goshen. They didn't seem to have any inclination to go back to Canaan. Let's don't lose track of that thought, okay? I, I think it's it's not the only possibility here, but it's it, it's I want it to lurk, <laughs> okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think that covers what I had in mind to say about uh, that stuff. Uh, yeah. Maybe if they'd gone back sooner, they wouldn't have been slaves. No. It looks like in verse 27, that Israel is used like in a corporate sense there and not pointing at the individual. Okay. Is that one of the first times it's used? Actually, I just read a commentary this morning that said, this is the first corporate use or national use of Israel as the whole, as opposed to just being Jacob himself, but meaning Jacob and all of his descendants and all of his family. Uh -huh. uh, Mark? You know, God's promise to Abraham was that he would give him the land in which he, you know, walked, that that would be his 
from the Lord. But he also, as we know, went to Egypt where he lied about who Sarah was. And so I kind of wonder <coughs> why the walking around in Canaan is the land he was given, but the walk around in um, Egypt isn't necessarily claimed as equally as the Canaan. I don't know. I'll give you my mom's opinion, which I don't necessarily share. <laughs> Canaan was a harsh and difficult land to survive. You had to trust God to survive there. Egypt, you could easily trust in yourself because of the Nile and all this stuff. Egypt was a place you could far more easily be secular. And there's gods there. A lot of gods. Yeah. Well, there are plenty of gods in Canaan, too. Uh, and they have to do with fertility and crops <laughs> and rain. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not sure, uh, other than uh, divine election or something of that nature, of why uh, Egypt doesn't appear to be the promised land. But it is, uh, it's interesting, Dorothy's word, they settled there, uh, they sat there, they lived there, they, they, they took up residence there. Uh, so uh, one of the commentaries called it... Uh, uh, a, a, a temporary home, a uh, transitional home. And uh, if you've ever been in a context where you needed a temporary or transitional kind of shelter, uh, those are nothing to be sneezed at. They just aren't the real thing, but they are the step to help you survive to that. Well, isn't it true that God's promises a blessing to his people through the Old Testament had to do with their worship and obedience to him. And there's not really a direct connection or mention of that in this passage of scripture, but there's no indication that they have turned from worship of God in this particular time of their sojourn in the Old Testament. So blessing is not, to me, would not be unusual at this point because it's very possible they were still worshiping God in the proper use of this place, whatever the term would be. Yeah. And, uh, and worship is equated with blessing. Am I, am I last? I mean, uh, no, no. Uh, one of the, as, as you talked, a part of what was going through my mind is, yeah, another one of these chapters that the word God doesn't even appear in it, uh, wh which makes some of us folks nervous because we want to... We want, we want to nail them to the worship wall or to the obedience wall. We want to nail down that they're still on track or that they're not on track, which is probably more a reflection of our heritage of constantly taking our own spiritual temperatures. And uh, you know, where am I now with God? Uh, if I die tonight, uh, all, all that sort of stuff. Uh, this just sort of trucks, trucks, trucks along because God's made a promise. And, and a part of what this illustrates is God caring for them and we don't know where they are on that process. Uh, and uh, we're just stuck with that, right? Um, I think something that I'm kind of playing with in my head is this idea that the land is still valuable. The land is, that God had promised them. So as they move to Goshen and as they settle, um, I almost am starting to get this feeling that they become complacent. And so what is it that God has to do in order for them to go? Because they, they're very successful in Egypt. Um, did they have to be made low in order for them to be willing to leave Egypt? Okay. Uh, that's a question that I think that Marcia was trying to get to the surface, even if she did or didn't know it at the beginning. Uh, yeah, w which this whole paragraph is basically about what? What does Jacob want? They're trying to survive and keep a remnant for God, basically. What is Jacob, well, the central, if you go right in the middle of this, the central thing that Jacob says to Joseph is what? Do not bury me in Egypt. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in, in, in the family cemetery back in the cave of Machpelah. Yeah. Uh, why? Yeah, I, I think that must be the case. The, the commentaries are so unanimous. C commentaries don't agree on lots of things. But this is one of the things that they seem to agree on that <clears throat> Jacob has a concern, particularly out of verse 27, that complacency and, hey, let's just stay here forever. Uh, it doesn't take very many generations for that to be kind of the reality of our lives. And uh, 
Well, I think every single one of us, maybe, at least with one or two exceptions there, uh, are, are descendants of immigrants of some variety. And uh, the thought of going back to wherever our ancestors came from, I don't think occupies our minds very much. We have complacent sounds like a bad word. We're just happy here. We have integrated here. This is us now. Uh, and and it, that appears to be, and frankly, Israel will be in Egypt more years than any of us, I mean, any of our ancestors that we trace back, unless any of you have Pilgrim, no, Jamestown founders. If you're the Pilgrim Fathers, we're still good. Uh, <laughs> that's not quite 400 years. Uh, if you're Jamestown folk, quite, it's a little over 400 years. Uh, but they're 400 years before they actually get to go back. Uh, so already they're worried in year what? One. 17. Uh, it, it, the, the old man, and this is characteristic of us old people, to worry about these sorts of things. Uh, 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 will my family settle in here? And by doing that, what do they lose? They have lost God's promise. They lose the promise of God. Now, it's interesting... They might make a lot more money. They might be a lot more comfortable. They might have a lot more if you want, material success, all kinds of things. And, and Jacob, do not bury me. And in fact, I want a humongous funeral procession back to Canaan. Now, this is 17 years. So what's the status of the famine and the plenty? It's, it's past. Famine is now history. Uh, they presumably could have gone already. Why not? Verse 27. They've settled. They've gained possessions. They've become fruitful. They've multiplied. Life is good. And the old man says, do not bury me here. Take me back. Right? Is there an expectation from, uh, from Jacob that in his death mm -hmm. and the return to the land to bury him, the family will return to the oh, land yeah, and stay? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, the possibility might exist, uh, or simply that they go visit and see and experience. Uh, they, they don't have the promise of wagons from Pharaoh now to carry them back. Uh, this uh, it is actually this is the beginning of about two chapters of dealing with Jacob's death. So we're going to work on this death thing for a long time uh, till you're sick of it and I'm sicker of it. Um, yeah. But t t to just go back, th this is one gigantic funeral procession. I don't know how they kept their lights on for that long a distance and how they got the police escort and all those sorts of things. Uh, also, didn't Joseph, at the, when he was to die, he told the people, you will, you will um, take his bones back. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Which is interesting. Uh, <coughs> don't bury me here, but whenever you go back, take my bones back. There's, there's a little bit lessening of the intensity here. Check. How long is the trip? What did the trip have been from Goshen to Canaan? Uh, the, the cave is in uh, Hebron, which is south Canaan. Um, it would be probably uh, three weeks uh, donkey travel, uh, maybe. Uh, it, particularly if you have women and children, you're camping. Uh, three, three or four weeks that way. Uh, you could do it in a week or less if you're just uh, a, a guy who rides and rides and rides <coughs> and uh, sleeps maybe six hours a night and then gets going again. Uh, the other piece of it is got to hit the oases where there's going to be water. And, and so you may ride less some days, travel shorter distances some days in order to make the water kind of thing. Mark? So if, if Jacob was aware of, you know, the, of your mother's opinion, um, <laughs> that, you know, life was easy <laughs> in Egypt and, you know, it could be a bad thing, um, I was struck by the fact that you said something that should have been obvious, but I hadn't even thought of it, was that the famine was over. Mm -hmm. So why didn't Jacob 
take the initiative as a patriarch to lead his family back where they were. Maybe he had a rebellion at the same time. You know, it's, it sounds like he wanted to enjoy the benefits of Egypt hey. as long as he was alive. It was a great hey. <laughs> yeah. He's 140 years old, man. Give him a break. Joseph had to leave Egypt because he had left. He still works. He still bears the second in command of the servant. Which may play into this uh, because uh, Jacob's words to, to Joseph, uh, sorry, I turned things off because we need to leave. If I have found favor in your sight, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. It's in verse 29. If I have found favor with you, is that the way fathers no. talk to sons? No. No. That, that's a recognition, I think, of Joseph's political status and power still. So, yeah. And the realization of his dreams. Mm -hmm. Perhaps so. Can I ask one thing? Uh, you suppose Joseph remembered back the night he spent talking to God or fighting the angel? Jacob? Yeah, excuse me, Jacob. Getting crippled that night. Uh my guess he did when he got up to go to the bathroom. So. <laughs> but wasn't there an interchange somewhere that indicated there was a responsibility there? To the land? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in several places there's that responsibility. Okay. Well, did, did, did the Israelites even have a right? Were they still slaves by no, definition? No, they weren't slaves. Not yet. No. What? Not they yet. Slaves. They're not so slaves they at this later. point. It's coming after this time when the famous line, uh, a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph. Well, this should keep you for a couple of weeks. Uh, those of you that don't like funerals and funeral planning and uh, funeral trips, uh, sorry, we're going to be in a, a long funeral spell in here. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah. Father, we are thankful for your promises and your word. We find ourselves in this text sort of between appearances and words from you. And the living of life in the between times when you haven't spoken and you aren't visibly, uniquely, newly present and uh, speaking can sometimes be troubling, challenging, and difficult for us. Teach us, as you were teaching Israel, to live out of the reality of your promises and not be dependent upon the experience of some new vision, revelation, or presence. Uh, we pray that you would teach us this in these days. In Christ's name, amen. Have a good week.